Good evening and welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Um, my name is Grace Taylor. I'm a sophomore here at Elon University. Uh, before we begin, I would ask you to please join me in offering a big thank you to our panelists, all of whom who have traveled to be here with us tonight. <laughs> Truly, thank you so much for the work that you do and the wisdom that you share with all of us, not only tonight, but also every other day. Um, we are so excited to introduce to you a group of wonderful women whose work at the intersection of faith and social justice is of utmost importance today in t t uh, social and political climates. The example set by each of these women, Samira, Yasmin, Rachel, Lauren, and Grace, are examples that we can all live up to as interfaith leaders. I have a few questions to ask the panelists before we open it up to a Q&A discussion um, from you all. So to begin, I would like to ask you to each of you to introduce yourselves and uh, what, say what you do, tell us what drives you to do your work at the intersection of faith and social justice. We can start at either end. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, good evening. Good evening. <laughs> uh, my name is yet. Hi, Noah. <laughs> my name is Yasmin Arrington. I am an Elon grad. I graduated in 2015. Uh, I double majored in strategic communications and history. I'm currently in my third and final year uh, as a Master of Divinity candidate at. Howard University School of Divinity. Oh, but, okay. HU love, I appreciate it. EU, you know, HU, you know. Um, <laughs> yes, that is also our callback. Um, a brief, just uh, more background. I was born and raised in Washington, D.C. Uh, so, as it, okay, D.C. love. <laughs> I'm liking this crowd. Um, so, I mean, th that, that is a lot in and of itself. Washington, D.C. carries a lot of history uh, in, in faith, uh, in religion, and in interfaith, and in social justice. Um, I, I am a member of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated, and I also run a nonprofit. I founded, um, when I was 16 years old, a nonprofit organization called Scholar Chips, and the CHIP stands for Children of Incarcerated Parents. We provide college scholarships, mentorship, and a support network to youth who have incarcerated parents. And we've had four, over 40, a total of 43 scholars since 2012, and we've awarded over $100,000 in college scholarships. Um, so. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I look forward to speaking with you this evening and all of our phenomenal panelists, a uh, very diverse group. And I, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out what is my, you know, what will be and is my role in interfaith and social justice. I really think at this point in time, uh, in this day and time, we ha it is imperative. It, 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 to me, it is not even a question anymore. We have to work together um, in order to, to build a better tomorrow, to have any hope. Because there are a lot of people who are hopeless. They're looking for their loss. They're looking for hope. And, and sometimes, for some reason, people think that the answer is suicide, or they think that the answer might be uh, uh, to kill other people, other innocent people, or to discriminate. So yeah, so we, we definitely, um, we, I'm, gl I'm blessed to be in this space and to be with you all, and we definitely uh, have to work together and figure out what the next steps are so that we can um, build a better future for ourselves and for our future children. Hard to follow that oh, up. Oh. <laughs> Um, hi, my name is Rachel Knowles. I'm a yoga instructor and um, I run a nonprofit that I founded called Cultivate Union. I live in Atlanta and, uh, okay, thanks. One clap. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so many claps prior. Um, yeah, so what's the question? What? Why do we uh, sorry, uh, to introduce yourselves, what do you do? What drives your work? At, uh, what drives our work? Yeah, what drives yeah. Um, I would say like uh, my belief in the potential of humanity drives my work and um, particularly I think that we hold 
a lot of the systems of oppression and domination that have uh, unsuccessfully ruled our world and our body. So I think that liberating our bodies uh, is a great start um, to working towards further liberation. And I think that working with yoga in particular um, is like a really beautiful democratic tool that um, almost anyone can do and work with. But the question is, why don't people have access? So those are the kinds of questions that I work with. Yeah, thank you. Okay, good evening. I'm Grace Burford, and I'm an associate chaplain at Davidson College. <laughs> but enough about me. Um, I do want to answer the question of what brings me to social justice work with some, just a little bit of Buddhist reflection. Because um, when I was thinking about this question, I realized that I wanted to turn it around and say, well, how does my feeling of being called to do this work reflect Buddhist ideas and practices? Because for me, it's the feeling of being called to do it that comes first. And then later I look at it and go, oh, yeah, that was really Buddhist. So, you know. So in that order, I feel things really deeply. And so when I encounter the suffering of beings and our home, this planet, I feel it. And the word for this is compassion, which at its roots means suffering with. So a gift? I don't know, but somehow I got this. I just do this. And um, Thich Nhat Hanh, who is a very well-known Zen Vietnamese um, Buddhist, has called us to listen for the sounds of the earth crying. And I heard those sounds. And um, so that response to me signals the compassion piece of at the heart of Buddhist understanding of things is compassion and wisdom. So the wisdom piece is, to me, another thing that I feel, which is a kind of radical connectedness. So why do I feel other beings suffering? I feel it because we're connected. And we're connected in a really kind of complicated way. Um, and that connection also is an opening. It's an opening to connect uh, and not to shut ourselves off. But it, is, it requires a lot of us. Buddhist teachings and certainly practices are really focused on transforming our sense of self and other and overcoming that distinction that we make as if it is the ultimate distinction. I stop here, you start there. Um, this kind of radical connectedness that Buddhism teaches that I feel um, requires us to overcome that um, or maybe allows us to overcome it. So um, the work I've actually done has been uh, it's taken a couple of different shapes. Um, those of you who know me know that I was a religious studies college professor for over 30 years. And I really did see teaching as a vocation, as a way to um, spread wisdom and compassion at the same time. I've been a practicing Buddhist since I was in college, so over 40 years. And so those things went hand in hand for me. And I um, have been active in, I'll just tell you what it's called, and then you can ask me later what the heck that means, spiritual deep ecology. And um, as a lesbian, feminist, Buddhist, I have lived intersectionality before there was ever <laughs> a term for that and have just, for some reason, not let that 
stop me from getting into those areas where those identities would have excluded me. Um, and so I've been a chaplain for about six years now, and um, I just see it as a continuation of that work of compassion and wisdom and caring. First time on a panel. My name is Samira. I live really close uh, from Milan, five minutes away, and um, I am Pakistani, Canadian, American, Muslim. So <laughs> I, I have faced different challenges. I've been here long enough where I have overcome different challenges. Uh, from language barriers to other things. And I can relate to lots of people that have been going through those challenges. So it's my personal calling. I know in my religion that um, we believe that, um, I'm gonna just give you a small story before I pass, uh, pass on to the next person. Um, I work with local refugees. It's called um, a, a group, ICT, Islamic Center of Triad, where we um, actually um, go from person to person um, and listen to their story and we kind of see what they need and we help them out even if it's a hug or they just need a medication for a kid, clothes, we collect fridges. I have personally dragged stuff from the garbage and taken it to them. Saw a lamp sitting outside on the side of the road, picked it up, wiped it up and then uh, taken it. I, I have sent um, clothes and things uh, internationally where we have shipped them to people that are still in desert in tents and things like that to different countries. So kind of, it like, it's like kind of endless work and sometimes people come and see me working and we have a warehouse in uh, Greensboro and they will ask me, one refugee, young boy, asked me a question. He said that, Samira, Samira, just answer one question. Why do you do this? Because he, he kind of learned a little bit about me, who I am. And he's like, why you do this? And then I had to answer that question, of course, from deep honesty, and I wasn't prepared to answer it. And I said, I said, because it makes me happy, it makes my heart happy. And also because if you're religiously speaking, God says that you have two rights, one on me and one on your people. I will forgive the rights you have on me because I'm God, but I'm not gonna forgive the rights you have on your people. So please fulfill the rights of the people around you. And I feel like I was placed in this location where there are so many refugees, so many people in need for a reason, for a purpose. I just don't want to go through life. I don't want to get one degree and another degree and another degree and another degree and a bigger house and a bigger car and a fancy life. I just want to have a meaning and a purpose. When I'm a 70, 80 years old, I want to think look back and think, yes, those people were around me and they needed something and they needed me and I helped them. And that was the purpose of my life. And I'm, I'm just, I do so many projects with refugees. Um, my recent project is about education. I have learned so much about them. The biggest hurdle they face is the language barrier. They don't speak um, English. And most of them don't have cars, they don't have any way to get to community colleges, they're so poor. And some of them have younger children, so they can't make it to college. So they kind of live here for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, not knowing the language, which is so sad. So I started this program with ACC, which is distance learning. So, uh, uh, so far what we have done is we have set up a program. All the refugees actually came to Elon, and thanks to Jane Fowler, she offered the space for free, and there were over 200 people here. We kind of talked about our program, and we are taking tests, and we're gonna register them with, um, with a learning program that we purchased online um, at Burlington, uh, Burlington English, where there are different levels in the program. So I think to educate somebody is the best thing we can do so they can find their own path and they can find their own life. So for us, the first part was to get them engaged. So right now we're in process of um, having each and every one of them have a laptop 
So I actually um, sit next to my friends and I was like, do you want to donate a laptop? Do you want to mm -hmm. give me a little bit of money? So I can buy. So I am actually collecting money from person to person. So far, my goal was to collect 20 laptops I already have, and 20 people already have laptops. That means 20 families have laptops. That means two of those people can access that laptop and learn English. So I can also monitor if they're not on their laptop learning. I do send them a friendly reminder, and I say, well, what's going on? <laughs> You're not on your laptop learning. So, so things like that. So that's just kind of something we're doing. As a, I'm, and I'm, I'm very thankful to have friends like that. Uh, they, they are in Elon. All the professors that are friends with me, they just jump in and help any project we start. Also, I want to thank ACC. They also help us in so many ways. I work there too, but they also help me in so many ways with all the projects we do. So, yeah, this is who I am. <laughs> just, just one more thing, that there are Elon students right now that are working on my project, Distance Learning. Just, that's what I wanted to say. They are working awesome. with me. Yeah. So, sorry. I'm so happy to be up here with all these amazing people. So cool. Um, okay, hi, my name's Lauren Fine. I'm the Director of Student Leadership at North Carolina Hillel, which is the Center for Jewish Life on campus, and I work at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, no, no big screams for UNC Chapel Hill? It's okay, it's all right, it's fine, go Heels, it's really fine. I know. Um, uh, so, I think, um, when, when I'm thinking about what calls me to do the work I do, uh, well, first of all, I should tell you the work I do. Um, so I work with students primarily um, on all of their programs that they plan and also on engaging their peers. So we have a, an interfaith chair who works on interfaith programming and a social justice chair who works on social justice programming. Um, and then also on the side, I'm the chair of my local chapter of Carolina Jews for Justice, which is a brand new organization um, that organizes Jews of all ages um, to work on local campaigns of all different causes. Um, so when I think about what leads me to do the work that I do, I loved what Grace said about um, sort of doing something and saying, huh, that seemed Buddhist, like, that, you know? Um, and so I, I, I really agree with that. It's sort of, um, I, I often do wonder, is, is this because I love justice work or is this because I'm Jewish? I don't know if I can ever know. But, um, but when I think about uh, Jewish values and how I was raised and what I learned growing up, a few things come to mind. Um, when I was younger, we always learned about Sadaka, which is char charitable giving, um, and it was always a part of Hebrew school growing up and a part of uh, my family's values, and also the value of tikkun olam, which is um, repairing the world, and it comes from this idea that um, when the world was created, it was sort of like a shattering of vessels, and it's our it's our duty to put the, the pieces back together. Um, so I was sort of raised on that foundation of always thinking of these, of these ideas. And then as I grew up, I started to think about how that actually played out in the world. Um, and I'm still trying to figure it out. There's so much going on all the time. Um, <laughs> but I think really what keeps me going and what calls me to do the work is the possibility of collective liberation and just the concept and the dream of having everyone be free. Thank you guys so much. Um, the next question we have for you is, how have you seen religious or people of faith successfully engage in social justice? Okay, are we doing like? What, what do you guys feel? Okay. Well, I need to, I didn't, um, okay, I didn't answer the last question because I, I got, I, as you, I got really passionate. Um, but in a nutshell, um, scholarships for children with incarcerated parents, why I do that work, uh, I myself am the child of a formerly incarcerated parent. My dad, my father has been in and out of jail and prison pretty much my whole life. Um, and also, um, you know, since everyone else, and I, I don't know why I omitted this initially, um, but, you know, I, my background, I grew up Christian. Um, I grew up in the Baptist denomination, even though I'm, I'm open, I don't, I don't necessarily limit myself to 
the Baptist denomination, um, but I do believe uh, that in following Jesus and, and following the teachings and following Christ, um, we are called, we, we, it is an obligation to serve, to serve others, or they may say, for lack of a better term, the least of these. Um, and and each, each and every one of you are my brothers and sisters. That is, that is how I've been taught, and that is, is how I see. So if, you know, I, I am expected to treat others the way I want to be treated. So if I don't do that, and if I don't live like Jesus, am I really a Christian? Like, am I really a follower, or am I a fan? And I don't, I don't want to be a fan of Jesus. I want to be a follower. So anyway, really quickly to answer your question, Grace, um, where, where have I seen success with religious groups like interfaith in, in certain movements? Um, one of the first thing, one of the first initiatives that I actually saw with my own eyes and got involved in was last year, I think it was in the summertime, through the National Action Network, which was founded um, by Reverend Al Sharpton. Uh, he did, they did what was called a thousand ministers march. They were only expecting a thousand ministers, okay? Ministers, chaplains, imams, rabbis, I mean, people showed out in droves, and we marched the streets of Washington, D.C., and there was a gentleman, um, there was a rabbi who was standing next to me, and he had a sign that said, and, and I, I'll never forget this as long as I live, and I took a picture of it, and he had a sign that said, Black Lives Matter to this rabbi, and, and, and I can't even explain to you what that did to me emotionally, what that did to me spiritually. Um, and, and there was an imam who was uh, an older gentleman who was walking and he said, you know, hey, may I interview you? And, and we had um, that kind of interaction. So that's sort of, um, I mean, marching, I, ha I have my own ideologies and theology about that. I think it's time to go above and beyond marching now at this point. Um, but <laughs> thank y'all. But yeah, so I'll just name a few and then I'll pass it on to be respectful of time. Uh, the NAACP, which stands for the National Action, um, not National Action Network anyway, you know what the NAACP stands for, <laughs> National Association of Colored People. Um, they have this initiative called the Black Church and HIV. Um, HIV is not something, it's still taboo, it's not something we really talk about, however, it still uh, affects millions of people, and, and especially in the black community, there are still many, many, many new cases and people who um, contract HIV and it turn, it, you know, even those who are, are walking, who are living with AIDS. Uh, and so they have this initiative and they go around the country and they train uh, par particularly pastors and, and, and groups like that because that's where a lot of the people are. Um, so that they have an initiative like that um, and then the campaign for poor people, that was started, the idea was conceived, yep, I believe the idea was conceived by Martin, uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. That one is still thriving and surviving today. Um, I, I, I'm trying to pronounce this well, anti-Sharia law. Um, there, there has been in, in past, like early 2000s, I don't know what's going on with it now. Um, there was this move where people wanted to, like Congress members and, 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 and lawyers, they wanted to outlaw uh, Sharia law or different uh, laws that Muslims abide by, you know, in relation to marriage and inheritance. So when they, if they go to court, you know, that that would not, their law would not be recognized. And there were people from various religious groups who got together and said, no, this is wrong, this is unacceptable, you are not going to outlaw Sharia law because, because when you do that, I believe that's unconstitutional, and a lot of other, other people of faith agreed. And once you do that, once you're, clearly we were attacking a specific group of people, and once you do that, you know it just continues the ripple effect. So when I saw and read about that, then, then that showed me that there are interfaith, um, 
initiatives that are, are really working. And there's also a group called CIVIC. It stands for Community Initiatives for Vis Visiting Immigrants in Confinement. I just learned recently in, like the la in January that there are also hundreds of uh, immigration detention centers. They are just, they are prisons pretty much. And when people come to the United States to seek asylum, or they are, as they may call it, turning themselves in, they're looking for a better life. Some people have traveled all the way from India and have smuggled themselves just to come to the United States. Uh, they are locked away, and sometimes for several years, five, seven, nine years. And so I think that's also a great place for um, the interfaith community to actually uh, unite around, and of course, uh, mass incarceration. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but there's a lot of work that is being done in a lot of different areas, um, uh, uh, social justice issues in this country. So I'll answer maybe in a more general way. Um, when I thought about this question, and I'll also preface that like I'm not attached or actively practicing any particular religion, um, but I do have a background that's deeply spiritual, and I'm always in the inquiry as a yoga instructor, like how do I fully live the teachings and um, not just be someone who teaches about the teachings, but. When I consider what movements feel really successful to me, I think about these questions that my friend um, Jeff, he runs a nonprofit that supports social entrepreneurs called Plywood People. And um, when we talk about our work, the main questions are, what's the problem you're trying to solve? And why are you the right person to solve the problem? And I think that's you know the heart of the inquiry that we can be in and that healthy organizations are in because it provides um, a clear perspective, right? Like knowing what you're doing. And then um, this is a big conversation that we had today in the workshop I led, is just truly, are you the right person to be in the work? Are there other people that need to be in the work? Are there people that you're trying to speak for that you actually don't need to be? And what could be more beneficial is inviting them in to use their voice. Um, are there times where I need to depower myself and step back? Um, so working with just uh, knowing that the work that I'm doing is personal, right? Like the problem solving that we all do is deeply personal. And that means we have to engage our community as a whole. Um, I think that looks different movement to movement. I think it requires a lot of honesty especially in saying when we've um, done something wrong and when we have to acknowledge that our intention is different than our impact. Uh, so that's more what I would offer for the question. And um, so I celebrate the people that are actively in that work, knowing that when we get really stuck in an end goal or an end outcome, we can miss the unfolding of the process. And for so many of us, the unfolding of the process and being in relationship and again, engaging with Humanity is where the solutions lie. So I want to just answer this question from uh, the perspective of engaged Buddhism, um, which is a phenomenon across the Buddhist world and really began in Buddhist Asia across all the different forms of Buddhism and um, obviously not every Buddhist, but there, it's also not limited in, to a particular group. And what this phrase refers to, engaged Buddhism, is that response to real crises, to real political, economic issues um, that people are encountering. And so it's always nonviolent. That's a by definition nonviolent nonviolent efforts to really express the ideals of Buddhism in practice and practice beyond sitting on your meditation cushion. Although one of the things that makes Buddhist activism Buddhist is that it is always linked with the inner work, 
that you can't do the outer work unless you're also doing the inner work at the same time. Um, so a couple of examples. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on the, the most obvious ones. You all know who the Dalai Lama is, so I won't talk about him. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh is another one whose work is very well known. I want to mention maybe some that you haven't heard of. There's a movement that originated, well, that takes place in Sri Lanka uh, called Sarvodaya Shramadana. And it, it arose in response to and as a counter to external development efforts that were coming in to improve the lives of the people in Sri Lanka. And um, this was instead a grassroots movement to tie in to Buddhist values and develop Buddhist economics, of all things. And um, it's been a very successful um, movement across the country in terms not only of economic development, I mean, getting the kind of service model that we all know about now, you know, where you go in and you don't say, well, this is what you need and I'm going to do it for you or help you do that. Instead, going in and having community conversations and allowing communities to de define what they would like. It might be they need to dig a new well. And so trying to involve the Buddhist leaders and the, the monks typically in the communities in that work. Um, so that's been very successful. And then there was a Cambodian monk uh, whose name is Mahagosananda. And um, he was uh, an amazing leader after the period, the horrible period of the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. And just fortuitously, he was out of the country when the Khmer Rouge came into power and um, his entire family was killed, as were many, many, many people. And he was instrumental with restoring spiritual life in Cambodia. He also sponsored annual peace walks that were about people coming out, all the people coming out and walking with the refugees as they came back from the camps where they had fled. Who I have trouble talking about this without choking up. But um, yeah, nearby in Thailand, um, you may have heard of probably the most um, well-publicized example of activism to improve the, um, the situation there is uh, the ecology monks who uh, were fighting the corporations coming in to cut down all the old growth jungle there, basically, and um, for the wood. And so they would ordain trees. So they, <laughs> They went through the whole Buddhist ordination ritual with a tree. And then the, um, that meant that the, the Buddhist loggers wouldn't cut that tree down. That was just not going to happen. So it was a very effective campaign. Uh, in Taiwan, there was a Buddhist nun. There is a Buddhist nun who started the Tzu Chi charitable organization, which is very involved with providing free medical care. and. Uh, in um, response, international response to emergency situations. In the United States, we don't have as many Buddhists, and so we don't have as much uh, going on in engaged Buddhism, but there are some really notable examples. Bernie Glassman started the Zen Peacemaker Order, in which he did things like uh, he held street retreats, so you've all heard meditation retreats, and uh, in in addition to meditation retreats, he would get groups of people to go and have uh, meditation and activism retreat on the streets, working with um, people who lived on the streets. Um, let's see. One other, I will just say the work that I've been most directly involved with is Joanna Macy's Spiritual Deep Ecology, which she's now calling the work that reconnects. And um, this, is, this started with the despair and empowerment workshops, which is where I kind of came on the scene was when she was doing that. And um, this is really addressing where we are 
situations where people are in despair about what is happening to them and happening to the world around them, happening to their communities and coming in and really working with everyone who shows up. So it, you don't have to be a Buddhist. This isn't one of those things that's called a Buddhist thing, although it is. she developed it from Buddhist principles. Um, but the work, the spiritual work that reconnects is um, supporting social justice from, from the inner work to the outer work. So for people who are burning out on the activism that they're doing, the work that reconnects kind of gives them a chance to reconnect with their own motivations and with the other people doing the work. So, um, I lost my thoughts. <laughs> but what I was going to say was that um, I moved here many years ago and I grew up in Pakistan, the only thing I knew was one religion, one culture, and basically one lifestyle. So when I moved to Canada, I had to learn so much, so many new things, so many new cultures, so many new religions, and I think that opened up my eyes. There was a concept of wrong and right in my mind. I was right and everybody else was wrong, and when I moved and I left that concept behind, that where I was always right and everybody, the other side was wrong and guilty all the time. And when I opened my heart and saw what was around me, I was more, um, I was surprised how much love I found and how much hatred in my mind I had to throw away. Mm. Because it was the brainwash that you get when you are in a certain culture, in a certain environment, by raised by certain values in a certain way. So the best way I found to help people was to learn people and be with people. So when I moved here, kind of, I, like I said, my whole journey, I learned a lot, a lot. So I connect with people at so many levels. So whatever um, projects I start, I always think that if, even if I helped one person, if I made a difference in one person's life today, I did something good. So I usually start at a very small level. And then the most amazing thing is that the way I see it is that it's a trickling effect. Like I started uh, for a so famous soccer player who, who's an immigrant here, had no, nobody to talk to, he was just a young kid. Started a soccer team for him, for children, local, like a church team kind of thing. And now he has over 100 students and he's very successful. And he's a professional, so he has found his thing. But we have done this for so many people that where they were here, they were immigrants and they were lost, and it was one person's effort. And I also see that there are so many good people around us that we don't know. The moment you open your mouth to you discuss your project, you tell them, they will jump to help you. And I remember when I started ICT, the first time we were sitting there and I said, well, we'll ask church to help this family, you know? And everybody's like, oh, no, 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 no church. I'm like, why? So I approached the church, I approached the, the people, I, I don't even know the right terms, who to talk to and everything. I go. That was my first time ever in a church, meeting, seeing what church is all about. First I asked them that if it's okay, if it's not rude, if I can see how you guys pray, and I watched that, and I, it was beautiful. So anyways, then I was surprised. Everybody in church was so happy to help us. They were like, not walking, they were running. I was overwhelmed. And then I got involved with the police, and then I was all, I'm always scared of police. I don't know why. It's their uniform. So when I was sitting in their office and talking to people, and then they were so normal. They were like me. Maybe they were scared of me. I don't know. But they must have thought Muslim terrorists or something like that, <laughs> watching news and all that. But they, they were, it was just all good people. In the end, all that work I have done in different areas, in different faiths, with different people, it's just people that matters. The more you open your heart, the more you open your eyes, the more you travel, you get to know, and more openly you look at a religion and a person and faith and their lifestyle, more accepting you are. I was so different before and I'm so different. And I feel all the work I did for others was actually for me. It, it helped me grow as a person. It made me become who I am today. I am here to like to serve and help people. Again, like um, when it comes to 
religion and social justice and stuff. Being here in that, this time where I am on TV, or my faith is on TV all the time, being the, the uh, what do you call it, <laughs> the terrorists or, you know, um, the, there's any attack anywhere, like in America, like there was a shooting at school. Swear to God, instead of worrying about kids, my kids and myself and my community worries about that that person's name is not Muhammad or Ali or Ahmad. Mm. That's our biggest worry. I was like, oh God, please don't be Ali. Please don't be Muhammad. Don't be Ahmad. I was like, oh, okay. So that's the first, because we're already like, we, which is so fair. Like anytime there's a crime, it's like being uh, a Muslim, Muslim terrorist. It's never a Christian terrorist. It's never like a Jewish terrorist. It's always like a Muslim terrorist. And that's, uh, that social media plays so against us. And my effort is, as an individual, as one Muslim woman, to change the world, like one person at a time. I interact with people, they find out, it's like, oh, you're Muslim? Okay. And then they, once they get to know me, their, their heart opens and their, you know, their feelings change towards who I am or what my faith tells me to do. So I think we can change things just one person at a time and make a difference. Like it's not, it's not, it doesn't have to be complicated. Just interact with people. I'm Muslim. Like ask me a question. If your neighbor's Muslim, ask them questions. You'll be surprised how much we have in common. We have so much in common and how little differences are there. So I guess like in the long run, I see that there are so many organizations that are helping the cause and there's so many people, celebrities that are speaking up about this media thing that the image they're doing for us right now. But at the same time, I think we need to be actively involved, all of us, actively involved, be there out there, working with people and letting them know that we are here, we're good people, we're here to stay and don't label us, please. Thank you. <laughs> You made me lose my train of thought now. Um, <laughs> so when I think of um, times when Jewish people have been uh, successful in movements, um, I think of this very famous photo of Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel um, marching next to Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, at Selma. And um, a lot of Jews use that now as like the quintessential look we care thing, um, but we have to move past that, truly. Um, but it's still an amazing example because when I think of success in movements, I think of um, answering a call for, for other marginalized communities. Um, so recently, um, I think it was this month, uh, there was a big action put on by um, Ben the Ark, which is um, a Jewish, organizing um, a national organization. And they got people um, from all over the country to march on Capitol Hill um, on behalf of Dreamers. And I think maybe 30 or 40 rabbis and Jewish activists were arrested in an act of civil disobedience um, fighting for Dreamers. And that was the first time I've felt inspired, like truly inspired by the Jewish community in a long time, just seeing the videos of them um, like on the Capitol singing Hebrew songs of liberation and um, filling, filling the, uh, the grand open space with music um, and you know, one by one being handcuffed. Uh, it was really powerful. And um, Abraham Joshua Heschel, uh, when he marched at Selma, wore a talit, a prayer shawl. And I think since then, it, that's sort of been um, a symbol of rabbis and Jewish people um, at marches, uh, which, which I think is really powerful because you wouldn't usually wear a talit anywhere but in synagogue when you're praying. Um, and so Abra uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel said, when I marched at Selma, it felt like my feet were praying. Um, and so I think of that as a powerful example. Um, I, I also, you know, someone made a joke once that uh, when Jews are nervous, we start creating like a lot of organizations. And so, <laughs> um, 
And so there's a lot of very cool Jewish organizations um, like uh, Jews for Racial and Economic Justice. Um, that's a really, really cool one that does um, particularly building coalition, uh, coalition building work um, with among Jews and people of color, uh, which is very, very cool. Um, and there are a lot of other organizations that are sort of following in their footsteps and building um, local chapters uh, and statewide initiatives and things like that. Um, and, and also, I just want to uh, address, too, that when I feel um, really successful as a, uh, about Jewish action, I think of Passover, which is the holiday that celebrates the Jewish exodus from Egypt. Um, and some, there's like, you know, there's some jokes about Passover because it's like we tell children at such a young age that like we almost died, but we survived, and this is how we did it. And we tell them the story from so young that they can't get the image of like of their own mortality out of their minds. Um, but <laughs> um, but I also think it's really powerful because it's this story that reminds us of where we have been and and where we are now and it's sort of, it's, it's humbling and empowering and it like reminds us of the path to liberation and, um, and so I think of that and all the opportunities that come with um, celebrating that holiday and all the other rituals that we do as a community that have been passed down for so many generations. Uh, so this was touched up a little bit, um, but how have you seen religious or people of faith fail at working to deconstruct power and privilege? How can these failures be lessons, and how can these lessons uh, be applied in the next time? The next time we are in the face of power and privilege. Do you want me to start? I can, we can go backwards. That'd be fun. <laughs> Great. Um, <laughs> okay, so. Um, well, I already mentioned that everyone still falls back on Abraham Joshua Heschel, like he did all of the work and now we don't have anything to do, which is just, we can't, we can't do that. Um, so I think there's, um, the downfalls have, have been particularly when um, within the Jewish community it's been really divided. Um, now there are all these different sects of Judaism that um, do ritual differently, have different beliefs, have different lifestyles, um, uh, which is funny because I, I think that some people on the outside of Judaism kind of see it as this one collective thing and it's so divided um, from the inside. And so I think that um, that weakens us a lot and it weakens our ability to contribute to social justice movements. Um, I also think that, um, you know, a few people on the panel touched on this, but there have been times when I've been in Jewish organizations and we plan a whole program and then we go to the Muslim community and we're like, okay, like now do this as part of the program instead, yeah. of, instead of meeting first and saying, what should we do together? What do we both need? You know, what are, what, what's your community's needs? What's my community's needs? And how can we uplift each other and work together for those? Um, but I've probably seen more of the former, so hopefully we're getting away from that, that trend. Um, and then I also think that um, there's a lot to be said about Judaism and race because, you know, one in four Jews is a Jew of color, and whether that be um, Jewish people of African descent or Jewish people of, you know, Sephardic Jews from Spain or Mizrahi Jews from um, the Middle East, it's, I, I think there's this, um, I'll, I'll throw a, a, an interesting word out there. So. Uh, Ashkenazi Judaism is, is Jews from Eastern Europe, are Ashkenazi. So there's this concept in Judaism, Ashkenormativity, um, which is basically like the idea that white Jews are at the center of all of Judaism and have all the power and all of the um, biggest leadership positions. And when people think about Jews and talk about Jews, they think about Ashkenazi practices only. Um, and I think that when we ignore Jews of color and don't hear about their experiences, that is a huge loss to not only our community, but every community. Um, and you know, they've sort of 
not had the privilege of assimilation as much as white Jews have had. Um, and so we have so much to learn from Jews of color uh, in coalition building and in, um, in uh, healing from trauma and um, in fighting oppression. And so there's just, it, it's exciting because there's so much work to be done, but it's also scary because there's so much work to be done. <laughs> I agree with her. Like, same here before 9-11, I think we, there are like six million Muslim here in America that live in different uh, states in peace and harmony. We didn't think about it being Muslim. We just always thought about ourselves as being Americans. So um, after 9-11, things kind of switched. And then we felt the need to be united or have organizations that kind of, uh, uh, kind of, you know, do stand up for us. Like my daughter's in a law school because she wants to be a lawyer so she can defend uh, Muslim women's rights and things like that. My son is in DC because he wants to do something that where he is in not just a physician or or somebody, but he's in a place of power where he can hit, our voice can be heard. We never felt that need before. I have been here long enough, and I don't remember that where I ever felt threatened my identity or my myself or I ever felt unsafe and I as like I said that I also believe like in independent work like work for yourself and work with your neighbor work with your friends kind of thing so personally I changed my attitude uh, completely after that when I saw so many things that were violent and gross and were happening against uh, uh, Muslims, most of the Muslims. So I thought that as an individual, what I can do, I can do something good. So my attitude is that me go, doing something good and being actively involved and contributing to society is really, really important. Before that, most people that immigrated from different Muslim countries, they moved here and they stayed in their small bubble. Like they lived the same life and they mimicked the same life. They did the same rituals. They ate the same food. <laughs> falafel was popular or biryani and whatever, you know, whatever your culture was, they stayed within their culture. They even wore their same clothes, like, you know, cultural clothes. Even if they left home, they will be wearing their sari or, you know, their shabar kameez or whatever, you know, because they didn't feel the need, they didn't feel threatened that their identity was being stolen or their identity was being modified or they are now terrorists all of a sudden. These peaceful, religious, kind, loving people so now we all feel like unsafe, first of all. We feel, feel like our children are unsafe. Anytime we're at the airport, we're the ones like, that are randomly being searched and then called out. And any time you go for an interview, I wish my name was Samantha, then Samira or something. So things will make, be, become easier, which is not fair right now because it's really hard having kids and you know, telling them constantly, you're safe, you're okay and just obsessively texting your child just to see that somebody did not. She's a law student, but he just did not hurt because she voiced her opinion about what was on TV was wrong. So all of that is gone, and I think we have changed our demeanor from being very passive and citizens minding our own business to people, those who want to be part of America actively where we can contribute and make change. Most of us are physicians. Most of Pakistani Muslims are physicians or IT people. We have or engineers, professional jobs, and but we were not, we were not going out and kind of being politicians like you know for a senator seat or we were not doing any of that because we felt so safe and we were such we were in a bubble. We were so comfortable, and I think all of that has changed now. Our children want completely different life now. They want to go out and they want to be in power, and they want to be heard, and they want to have the same safety. So we have started that path. We didn't have that before. But it's a good change for new generation that they're thinking about that, including myself. Like, I am thinking about that, that how I can be, how I can be more helpful to people around me and not live in a bubble of my own, you know. I used to think it was so important for me to go to mosque and pray. But now I think it's more important for me to go see what happens in church and what, what happens in, you know, why uh, my Indian friends I had for so long, I've never been to their worship place. I want to see what they do. 
what kind of things they like, what kind of things happen there, just to get to know the life around us. And I think it goes the same way. We were always the exotic family that lived next door to the white family. They just also was like, oh, I love your samosas. The butter chicken's so good. <laughs> biryani, biryani. Like, we were never people to them. You know, and if I was ever wearing like heavily embroidered outfit, it was just fascinating. It was just fascinating. Even up to today, yesterday, I was standing in a hotel and the guy goes like, whatever you're wearing costume, it's gorgeous. I'm like, okay. So it's just, we were just fascinating to people. That's not, that's not, we're, we're just people like everybody else and with a culture that is slightly different, a culture that we appreciate and love and want to keep and don't want to give up. One thing before I move forward is that working with the refugees, I learned so much. The fear, the fear that they bring with them because they've been through so much. Mm -hmm. Like, it's unbelievable process they've been when they get here. So they are so afraid to lose their culture, lose their identity, lose their language, lose their faith to America. So they try to protect it even harder. Like, I want a female physician for my daughter. I don't want my daughter to go sit next to boys, things like that. They're even more, so it's so important that we buddy them up with Americans so they see that how much stuff we have in common. So the one project I'm doing is that every new family that comes here, I find an American family that is, has common age children or parallel values so they can buddy up with them. So I, I took the seer and buddy, buddied, him, buddied him up or made friends with the lorry. So Lori visited the seer, the seer and the seer knows like Lori's a human. She's not just some scary white lady who wants to steal her religion, faith, culture, language, everything. She respects him for who he is and she values him for who he is. So that disconnect, I think that that's your last question and I'm gonna already answer that one. The disconnect that we have is scary. So we need to build bridges between people that are living among us. I'm not the exotic brown neighbor from Pakistan <laughs> who eats biryani. I'm just a regular American who goes to work, who has number of degrees, who's highly educated, whose husband's accomplished, who's, my kids are accomplished, whatever, you know. But what I'm saying is that we are just all people. We need to get out of our houses and get to know our neighbors, especially if the neighbors look different. Get to know them. It's very, very important. You will find so much love and you will find so much respect and you will find a comfort zone for yourself that I know them, right? So. So, um, it's a little embarrassing to go after that because Buddhists have the opposite problem. We are sort of thrown together as we, oh, we're all great. You know, everybody thinks we're really great. Um, which is, is nice. Uh, I'll admit it's really nice to have people respond positively, most people in the West. Um, but. Um, it is also sort of, uh, it, makes, it makes difference invisible. Um, and so, I'll just say that. Uh, and then maybe I can come back around to this observation in a second, because I think what tends to happen is that uh, I find myself explaining that Buddhists are human beings too, and not all Buddhists are perfect Buddhists. This comes as a shock to people. Uh, which is, but it is sad. We can see quite a lot of evidence that Buddhists are not perfect Buddhists. Um, Buddhist nationalism is on the rise in Asia and in Sri Lanka. One of the things that the Sarvodya Sharmadana movement does is uh, they reach out across the divide. The big divide in Sri Lanka is between the Buddhists and the Hindu Tamils. And so that group reaches out to the Tamils to try to connect with, you know, to break down that division. But the reason they have to do it is because the government is extremely nationalistic and, and uh, the violence against the Tamils I mean, is basically what ended the Civil War is they just killed so many of them in this violent onslaught that the Tamils basically lost. 
Uh, this is, as a Buddhist, this is not something that uh, I look on with any calm. Uh, so that's a point for practice on my part. But the, the truth is that Buddhists, even engaged Buddhists, tend not to engage politically. So that is, so that's why the Sarvodaya Shramadana movement is, is unusual in stepping out like that. And the biggest failure that Buddhists are demonstrating to the world these days is happening in Burma, Myanmar, where the just violent persecution of the Muslims uh, in, in Burma right now is just, it's appalling. It, and I feel like this, uh, forgive me if this is not welcome, but I feel some kind of understanding of what it is, must be like for Muslims to see Muslim terrorism, Muslim labeled terrorism anyway, with terrorists labeling themselves as doing what they're doing in the name of Islam because Oh, it's just in the news all the time. These Buddhists in Burma, these Buddhists in Burma are like getting rid of these Muslims. And it is just, it is horrific. It is horrific. Um, so I, I want to mention the Buddhist Peace Fellowship, which is an organization that um, has it had, it has ebbed and flowed. And right now it is in a growing form. It's, it's based in the San Francisco area. And the reason it is growing again is because it's been taken up by a whole new generation, young people who are Buddhist and they are politically active and they are really out there naming these things and, and calling Buddhists to step up and to live in individually and as communities, right livelihood and live by, especially that first precept, precept I undertake to refrain from killing. And this is, this is very powerful because it, it doesn't have any sort of parameters around it. It's not, I undertake to refrain from killing human beings when nobody's told me that I should. Uh, it's just, I undertake to refrain from killing. And then the other piece of that is the practice, practice, practice of seeing things the way they really are so that if we practice this when things are calm around us, that perhaps in the middle of a, a situation that is threatening to us, that engenders fear, that we have practiced seeing what's actually happening and responding to that instead of to the fear. I'll stop there. Uh, I think that's such a lovely place for you to end and for me to start because it's something that I consider a lot um, in terms of deconstructing power and privilege uh, and naming that the way that I think of power is ability to influence and privilege is access to resources. Um, I think that's a good thing to start with <laughs> so we're all talking about the same thing. But um, when I consider those things and how they show up in our lives, it's also important to name that our lives are impacted by systems that are deeply broken, and it's all of our responsibilities to consider how those systems show up in ourselves, how we have internalized those systems of oppression, of, of domination, that make it so that um, I want to hoard power and I don't want to share, or my resources are my resources and they're not for you. And these aren't things that are there are things that we play out as people, but it's actually not personal. So we have to spend so much time deconstructing that part of ourselves that responds from a place of fear because it's literally what our brain has wired us to do to survive. So we have to really consider what am I doing? Why am I doing it? How do I continue to perpetuate these systems? How do I actively perpetuate um, sexism, even as a woman, racism, as a person of color, um, colonialism, imperialism. What is a part of me that shows up into my work and wants to make something right straight away, get to the answer? Um, I know what needs to happen, so bless you. Uh, uh, <laughs> those are the questions that I'm always 
working at. And I think when we are engaging in those questions, um, it can feel quite tedious, right? And it can feel like ugh, moving like grains of sand or something. But, um, you know, I don't know the direct quote, but Audre Lorde, a black feminist, says like the man master's tools aren't gonna like dismantle the master systems. So we have to consider that for hundreds of years we've been living in these broken systems and so many of the tools that we think um, we need to use actually really need to be like deeply reevaluated. And um, then I'm gonna come back to Star Wars, which I also talked about earlier in my, in my session, because Star Wars is so good and, um, and I was like, you know, spoiler alert, by the way, if you haven't watched Star Wars, it's really, you're late to the game, so I think it's okay to have a spoiler. But um, there's a moment in, in Star Wars, in the latest one, where the young woman says, you know, this is how we win, not by fighting what we hate, but by saving what we love. Yeah. And so when we consider that, um, like, if we love ourselves and other people enough to move, like, in that granular, uh, like just deep, deep, deep examination that takes so much time. Um, that's why we do it, right? And we do it from a place of love and we do it from a place of courage of moving from our heart, um, not just in just resistance to what we don't want. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. More movements like that. That's what I'm gonna see. Um, I'm gonna try to be brief and succinct. I have a tendency to get long-winded. Um, but, um, okay, so first this question, how, how have I seen or when have I seen faith community fail in deconstructing power and privilege? Um, <laughs> this is a huge pro, I'm gonna call it a problem. Uh, in, in the Christian world and realm. And um, uh, there's, there's, for lack of a better term, a great division amongst the different denominations. Um, not in the sense that we're divided in what we believe. I think that, that there's consistency there. But how we actually live that out and mobilize it is, is not always ideal. Um, and so we have a tendency to work in these, I wrote it down, individual autonomous silos. So the Baptists are over here, the Methodists are over there, the um, Presbyterians, the Episcopals, right? And I think that we would be so much more bomb and so much, in, in a good way, so much more effective if we could like do some things together. I mean, uh, granted, you could, we could have our own, we can have our, thank you, we could have our own, um, if we really want to have our own, you know, we go on Sundays or Saturdays and you have your worship experience. I think that's great and that's fine because that's how we relate to the world and that's how we connect. But when we're talking about social issues, we have to be collect collective, one mind, one body, one sound, right, in order to make an effective difference. Um, but it, on a smaller scale, see, I'm getting long-winded again, but I'm gonna bring it, I'm gonna bring it back real quick. I'm gonna bring it back. So it, within, I'm gonna, make this uh, in my own personal context. So how I've seen this actually fail in us deconstructing power and privilege in the Baptist community, let me tell you, a lot of these men, they just, they just, they won't, they won't share. Point blank period, they will not share. They won't share their power. They won't share the decision making. They won't share the say so. Like there are still organizations and as they call them conferences, hundreds of these conferences. Like for example, don't tell them I said this, um, but the Baptist Ministers Conference of DC and vicinity, it is a, ma a complete male organization. They have a separate organization for the women and it's something about the wives of the Baptist ministers, wives and widows of the, ba like, are you serious in 2017? Are you serious? <laughs> and so, like, what happens when you only have a predominantly, you have, it's all Christian, they're all males, most of them are straight, 
And so you just have these guys like talking amongst themselves about how we're gonna solve problems. Where is the young people's voice? Where are the millennial voices? Where are the Generation Z and the Generation I? Where are the women? Where are the LGBTQ? Like, where are these people? Like, we should, we, they should be in the room, right? And then the last thing I'll say is that, um, and so that, that's why we haven't been able to get so much done, is because these men are just sitting there and they meet every Monday, literally, like either every Monday or two or three Mondays per month, 12 months in a year, every year, and they still talking about the same stuff. <laughs> it's like y'all. So anyway, that's where I've seen it fail. And then what I have here is 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 what my idea is. Um, we have to continue to place ourselves in positions of power and moral authority, not just in our churches, synagogues, mosques, universities, and community centers, which is good, but. Um, we need a revolution of the power dynamics in this country as we can see the people's fate is based on the mindsets and agendas of the people who are in the highest seats of authority and decision making in this country. Yeah. So our last question for our panelists are: is what is one thing that you would suggest to help people work together across lines of religious difference to enact the social justice we aim to see? Can you ask that question one more time? Yes, ma'am. Uh, what is one thing you would suggest to help people work together across lines of religious difference to enact social justice? Work together across social lines. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, well, uh, last summer I went to a workshop that was called um, The Intersections of Anti-Semitism and Racism, um, and it was amazing. Uh, but I learned for the first time what it meant to have um, internalized anti-Semitism or internalized oppression. And it's more than just sort of, you know, reflecting the ideas of the majority and like onto yourself and um, absorbing those ideas. Like some people think of internalized oppression as like uh, self-hatred because of society's hatred of you, um, which is definitely part of it. But it's also so much more than that. And, and for the Jewish community, um, it can be linked back to um, trauma from generations prior. Um, and it really started to make me think about, you know, why my family is the way that my family is and why my organization is the way that my organization is and how we operate from a place of fear because of this internalized oppression. Um, and so at this workshop I learned about how um, this is pervasive in all forms of oppression and everyone has their own trauma to fight um, and, and it um, presents itself in different ways. And so I think that something that would really help is for every marginalized community to have trainings on their own internalized oppression and how oppression functions in their lives and in the lives of their communities. Um, and then to also learn about the other forms of oppression because all of these different systems were built together and that means they have to be torn down together. If I spend my whole life fight fighting anti-Semitism, just that, it's still not going to go away because it's upheld by the other systems of oppression. Um, and if I don't fight racism, anti-Semitism will never go away. And, and so I think the biggest thing for me in my mind is that none of us is free until all of us are free. Um, and that, you know, Jews have to offer our power um, unconditionally to other marginalized communities. Um, and that we just have to, ultimately, we just have to work together and know each other. So sorry, I just got a time check. If we could do last sentiments, that would be awesome. Thank you so much. I, th I think I was gonna just say what she said, that if we work together, we're better. We need to, to work on the disconnect that we have as a community, as a nation, like we're in small, 
uh, you know, pieces, but if we come together, we can maybe, maybe, like she said that you can stop hating Jews, but if racism exists, that will exist. It's all linked together. So if we work on each piece, maybe we can get better. We can heal <coughs> together. So. Pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I would just emphasize the sentiment that so many of these systems of oppression um, strip us of our true identity. And so there's a responsibility that we have to educate ourselves on who are we really? Um, how do we celebrate each other in the way that we want to be celebrated? And also educate ourselves about um, what we don't know about each other. Mm. I would say um, we can all individually, we can do this individually and also collectively, is to choose a focus or a social cause that you care about, that you're passionate about, and get others involved. And get others involved across religions, across uh, genders, across you know, uh, socioeconomic status, location. And um, really quickly, there's this quote um, by Howard Zinn that I saw today by one of, LD, LD Russell. Um, it's a, yeah, LD. <laughs> it says, to be hopeful in bad times is not just foolishly romantic. If we remember those times and places where people have behaved magnificently, this gives us the energy to act and at least the possibility of sending this spinning top of a world in a different direction. That was amazing. Um, LD is my professor, so he will have a field day when I tell oh, him you yeah. used his quote. But yeah. um, thank you so much again for your presence in this panel. I know everyone, including myself, take many things from this room. Um, this conversation is such an important one, and I thank you for being a part of this. Uh, it's a no way over. Um, we may have run out of time tonight, but I hope and I am hopeful that you guys will continue this conversation and dialogue outside of this room. Um, be sure um, to head back to Newman Lumen, which is the McBride space, which is the space that we were just in for Sacred Sounds after this. Thank you guys so much.